evening. And uh, welcome to our final week of events of this uh, school year. We're pleased to welcome tonight General David Petraeus uh, to campus. General Petraeus, as you know, is a legendary figure in the U.S. military and in American governance. We had the chance to work together a bit um, when I was in the administration in Washington, and we're really honored that you've made the time. And he's at the end of a long transcontinental journey here, so um, I just spent an hour with him on a podcast. He doesn't seem any the worse for wear, but uh, we, we very much appreciate you making the time to be with us. Um, the uh, on up, upcoming events, I will be sitting down with members of the IOP's Board of Advisors uh, for a conversation about the 2020 election as part of our university's alumni weekend celebrations. And you can find out more uh, about all of our upcoming events um, and uh, the IOP itself at our website, politics.uchicago.edu. As always, we'll be taking questions uh, from the audience. As always, we will prioritize student questions uh, for the first three. Um, as always, we will ask that you make a question a question <coughs> and not a statement. Uh, so end it with a question mark. Uh, make sure your phones are on silent. The restrooms are, are, are downstairs. And here to formally introduce our, our speaker is Yang Xiang. Yang is a PhD student in sociology uh, from, from Sichuan, China. Uh, he's been an active participant in IOP events. Uh, in fact, usually the first at the microphone for the questions. Are you going to double back? And, <laughs> and always had, and it has an insightful question to ask our guests. Please join me in welcoming Yang to the podium. American global leadership is being watched and is being tested on a number of fronts. This year alone, the United States has to respond to regime change in Venezuela and alleged threats from Iran. Additionally, we've seen a trade war with China, U.S.'s number one trading partner, as well as its potential number one strategic rival. As a student coming from China, I'm deeply concerned with the escalating trade dispute spilling over into technology and perhaps into many other domains. Are the two sides playing the art of the deal or the art of the bluff? Will the world see another cold war or a cold peace or perhaps deeper cooperation and integration? No one is perhaps more eligible to provide wisdom in these issues and other foreign policy concerns than our four-star general, David Petraeus. With military career spanning over 37 years, Mr. Petraeus is considered one of the most effective military leaders or great battle captains of recent American history. From 2004 to 2011, he served as head of the multinational forces in Iraq, commander of the coalition forces in Iraq, and commander of US and NATO forces in Afghanistan. His command during these years has earned him the comparisons to Ulysses Grant, John Pershing, George Marshall, and Dwight Eisenhower. I knew all these names. <laughs> Following his military service, he was director of CIA from 2011 to 2012 under President Obama. In short, General Petraeus is one of the few Americans in uniform who managed to combine the technical side of warfare, tactics, and operation with a broader grand strategy, diplomacy, and communication. He is now a partner with a global investment firm, KKR, where he chairs the Global Institute. Moderating this conversation is Natasha Bertrand, She's the national security correspondent for political and an MSNBC contributor. It is my privilege to do this introduction, and please join me in welcoming both of them.
Thank you so much for Pleasure. being with us today. I know you've had a very long two days, General the Petraeus. Long, the longest really... day is supposed to be celebrated tomorrow, but I am actually living it today. So yes, yes, I and was that's in, actually in Berlin yesterday, and so London this morning. London, it was. Yeah, I came from London this morning. Yeah. So and go that's... to Washington tonight. <laughs> you're a, you're a anything for the axe, David <laughs> Axelrod. There you go. I'm sure he loved that. Um, so tomorrow is the 75th anniversary mm -hmm. of D-Day, and that's actually where I wanted to start. Um, I want to get your reflections on the 75th anniversary and, you know, the, the importance of our allies at that moment, in this moment, the subsequent creation of NATO, the, the things that now seem to be the, the things that we seem to have taken for granted mm -hmm. um, that are now slowly being eroded. Um, I wonder how you perceive this moment that we're living in, reflecting on um, 75 years. Well, it's interesting. First of all, I am a huge believer in alliances and coalitions, uh, even though they take a lot of coalition maintenance. Uh, I commanded, was privileged to command in Afghanistan, as was noted. Uh, but that was the largest fighting coalition, I believe, with something like 65 countries with uh, soldiers actually on the ground fighting. It took a huge amount of effort. I mean, I realized one time that I was giving more minutes of my time to a prime minister and his defense minister than he was providing troops to our effort. But it was worth it. Uh, I do believe that the strength of many is very, very important, even if in some cases uh, it is not that tangible actually on the ground. I, I subscribe, therefore, to Winston Churchill's idea that the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. Um, obviously, that coalition, if you will, the allies who defeated uh, the Nazis uh, in Europe and, and, of course, the Japanese forces uh, in the Pacific. That was an alliance effort, certainly U.S.-led uh, in a number of the different areas. But uh, I actually was just asked to go back and reread uh, a great speech that President Reagan gave called The Boys of Pont de Hoc. This is this very, this point where the Rangers climbed up and took out German fortifications. It was an extraordinary effort huge casualties, uh, incredible courage. And he certainly lauded them as he should and, and uh, recalled what they had done. And they, some of the veterans were still alive at that time, this being some uh, 35 or, or 40 years ago on a D-Day observance. But then he went on to outline the principles uh, that he subscribe to as the president, which I think are still very, very valid. And that was the point of the essay that I wrote, I think might come out tomorrow from the Reagan Library. Uh, and it had to do with, again, the value of allies, the value of coalitions, the value of principles, uh, democracy, and, and so forth. Do you see your essay so, as a rebuke of, of the Trump administration? Well, again, if you believe in allies uh, and as however much you may be frustrated by the inability of some of them to spend 2% of GDP, as all of the allied leaders agreed some years back at a summit in Wales, um, then certainly you want to have them with, with you. Um, I, in fact, to build a little bit on the kind introduction uh, of the student from China, I firmly believe that the most important relationship in the world right now is that between the U.S. and China. It is China, China, China. Uh, keeping in mind, by the way, that I fervently would like to see this be mutually beneficial and not zero sum, certainly with my eyes wide open about the uh, challenges that each side has presented to the other, the activities of China that for which they have been called out, not just by this administration, but by other administrations, and a recognition of a bipartisan consensus that certain assumptions we had that if we welcome China to the WTO and so forth uh, have actually not borne out. Uh, it hasn't become more open, more transparent, more like us. Uh, that has actually reversed somewhat. Having said that, again, they're not just our biggest street strategic competitor. They are also among our biggest trading partners. Canada, Mexico, and China, far and away, uh, again, are the 
the big trading partners. It's a hugely important market. Uh, the firm in which I'm invested is, I think, the biggest investor of our type in China, as well as Japan and India and a lot of else in Asia and so forth. So this is a relationship I'd like to see work. But in the meantime, as you are going to uh, present issues to them, you want to do that with a united front. And so every decision, I think, that we take when it comes to any kind of foreign policy should have to ask a, answer a question, uh, what will this do to the US-China relationship? And therefore, for that reason, and I wrote about this at the time, uh, we, I felt very strongly that we should support the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And by the way, not for the modest economic gains that it would provide for us. Most economists thought it would be well under even just a half percent of GDP that we would benefit, but more because of the geostrategic importance of, again, helping to prevent, present a united front. Uh, again, if you're going to negotiate with another country, you want as many folks on your side. And we uniquely enjoy enormous number of allies, not just with NATO Europe, the most successful alliance, I think, in history, but also with South Korea, with Japan, with Australia and New Zealand, uh, and then partnerships with a number of other countries. And in fact, our Indo-Pacific partnership uh, does reflect a number of factors that would be part of what I've called for, actually, in a monograph at the Belfer Center uh, at Harvard. And it was titled, Coherence and Comprehensiveness, colon, an American foreign policy imperative, implying that we, that's what we should seek. Um, again, if you're going to deal with China, you want to do it, again, with as many folks on, on your side uh, as you possibly can muster. Um, and it's a very, very tricky situation to, on the one hand, call on an ally to do what that ally's leader agreed that that country would do at the Wales summit, um, but then to go too far. And I think occasionally, uh, certainly some of the rhetoric that has been employed uh, would not be what I would have advised. So, so jumping off of that, in terms of having united front, in terms of having our allies on our side, do you think that irreversible damage has been done to those alliances, not necessarily because of the rhetoric, but because of the president's actions with regard to the intelligence community. So you have a background in intelligence. You were CIA director um, between 2011 and 2012. And the president has pretty much all out declared war on the intelligence community. He has issued a sweeping declassification order to the Attorney General to essentially declassify whatever information um, about 2016 that he wants. He revealed classified information that the Israelis gave us to the Russians in 20, 2017. So I wonder if our allies can trust us with this intelligence partnership, knowing that the President has these impulses and, and, and can be this loose cannon. First of all, let me just say I'm very confident in the workforce at the CIA, really in the intelligence community writ large. This is. These are all professionals. In fact, right now, uh, which is somewhat unique, it's been a number of years since the CIA actually had a director who was up through the ranks, if you will. It's normally a political appointee from outside, as, as I was. At least I was within government, knew a lot of them, but again, was not of them. Um, they're all professionals. They know they are committed to speaking truth to power. Uh, they know what happens when, if you get it wrong, and they haven't been right all along, obviously, and, and they take that very, very seriously. And that is an obligation they feel, and I am confident that they will uh, discharge that. They'll meet that obligation. I'm s confident in the military. Uh, I'm a bit more worried about the Department of Justice and some of the entities within that, um, certainly. Uh, and then, you know, you talked about the allies. Um, I think certainly that some of them publicly have said uh, that they need to look a bit more to self-reliance. Chancellor Merkel has uh, quite publicly a, a, a set of differences uh, with the administration. Um, but I, I don't think that any of that uh, is something that can't continue to stay together. And in fact, in general, and again, I was just not just in Berlin, I was also uh, in Switzerland with a big gathering called Bilderberg uh, 
um, and then before that was in Tallinn, Estonia, uh, where NATO has its cyber cooperative center of excellence for cyber defense uh, and a big gathering. Also saw the NATO Secretary General and a lot of other leaders uh, during the course of these different uh, events and visits. Uh, I would actually contend that NATO is stronger right now in many objective ways uh, than it was, say, just five years ago. Uh, in part just because the U.S. is spending so much more on defense. And keep in mind that as the U.S. goes in capability, so goes NATO. U.S. spends more than twice as much, a good bit more than twice as much uh, as all of the other 28 members of NATO spend together. Uh, so that is enormous. Um, and we have worked our way out of a lot of the readiness challenges that lingered from the heavy involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan and then sequestration, which in some ways was even, even worse. Um, in the meantime, uh, the European countries are out of the Euro crisis. That allows them to spend a bit more. I don't doubt that they're responding to some degree uh, by, to criticism, not just from this president, by the way, but from the previous president. It wasn't quite uh, the same rhetoric. Uh, it didn't use Twitter quite the same way. Um, but again, this is not unique to this president, and I heard this with Secretary Gates at his final event. I was a NATO four-star at the time, uh, and US, and um, you know we thought this was gonna be his sort of valedictory address. They're all praising him, it came to him, and he just hammered them over their uh, inability to spend 2% of GDP. Um, so if you look at that, they're actually spending a bit more, and again, some of that is a result of that. And then, of course, frankly, you also have what is the greatest gift to NATO since the end of the Cold War, and that is Vladimir Putin. Um, he's given everyone a reason to live. The alliance has a purpose once again, the in invasion of southeastern Ukraine, the occupation of Crimea, the previous invasion of parts of Georgia, the threatening of the Baltic states. All of this has galvanized NATO in a way that really wasn't present uh, since the end of the Cold War. So I would actually contend that NATO, and I, the Secretary General certainly uh, thinks that, um, although certainly there is friction uh, at the highest levels uh, between uh, a number of the leaders of NATO countries and, and ours. So you mentioned Russia, so I, I have to ask you, did, <clears throat> did you read the Mueller report? No. <laughs> I wonder, though. I mean, obviously, I read all the news accounts. Right. I read the summaries. I read, uh, I read his statement actually. After two years. I mean, years, it's about how many hundred pages? It's I, about four hundred fifty-eight pages. I do have a day job. It's I'm lengthy. afraid. Yeah, it's like actually you can several read the other jobs. I'm also still a professor in a couple of places and and a variety of other things. Well, we can come back to Russia in a, in a minute, but I just have to ask you. You mentioned Gina Haspel. Yep. Um, and how she rose up the ranks through the CIA, and she's an internal rather than an yep. external political yep. hire. And I was hugely impressed by her, actually, when I was the director, and in fact, tried to maneuver her and a couple of others into positions from which they could aspire to be the deputy director, which is actually about as high as any professional can ever aspire to be in the CIA, because again, you have a political appointee. She was serving as the deputy. Mike Pompeo went to state. The president already had some assessment of her uh, and obviously elevated to her, and I think she has um, she's certainly been a quiet presence in terms of press, but so was I, actually, after not a very quiet presence as a four-star. Um, very, very accessible because it was required, especially during the surge in Iraq. Um, but I think she has approached this properly. I think she has been very forthright. They only do, usually, only one uh, open testimony a year, and that's the annual the global threat session that they do. And I thought the DNI and she and the others actually at the table were all quite forthright and professional in what they offered. And they did say that China is the number one threat, it seems. Facing well, this has been States. a feature of, of all assessments. It's a feature of the national security strategy that was done when my old uh, comrade, protege H.R. McMaster, was the national security advisor. It's a feature in the national defense strategy, which followed from the national security strategy when my great comrade, shipmate, Jim Mattis was the secretary, and it has continued to be a feature in the, all of the unclassified documents as well. And I think it is, it is correct. We are in an era, once again, of great power rivalries, 
Um, the most important of which is far and away is that between the U.S. and China. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't also be mutually beneficial. And my hope, again, is that we could restore the kind of trust and confidence and so forth. Uh, but I do fear that we are already in the early stages of a degree of a tech Cold War. Uh, at the very least, I think there are going to be supply chain reverberations uh, just from a result of what has transpired so far. That does not mean it has to go f all the way into a true Cold War, uh, and one would hope that we would draw back. And as David uh, said in his uh, opening, you know, is this the, the, or actually maybe you did in your introduction, you know, is this the negotiating tactics, keeping in mind that we have someone who wrote a book called The Art of the Deal in which he explains that before you sit down across the table, uh, and negotiate with someone, you punch the other guy in the nose. I mean, we're doing that to Mexico right now. Um, and again, I hope that that is just the attention getting step. Uh, it clearly has gotten the attention of Mexico. Obviously, their foreign minister and a whole delegation are in Washington right now uh, trying to resolve the, what are, again, legitimate and understandable concerns about the wave of Central American migrants coming through Mexico uh, and into the United States. So the, the reason that I asked about Gina Haspel is because she obviously has a controversial past yep. with regard to torture. And you... Which, by the way, I publicly opposed. Right. Now, I was not in the agency at the time. I was, however, in Iraq, because I was there as a two-star, three-star in, and four-star. And in the very beginning, we were confronted by having detainees. I mean prisoners of war, if you will, except that it wasn't a declared war, so the term was detainee. And I remember sitting down with uh, my leaders and, uh, and then our, our legal counsel, staff judge advocate, and we ultimately decided, look, we don't know anything about interrogations. Uh, we don't, this is not something for which we have ever trained. Uh, we do what's called battlefield interrogation, which is at a very tactical level, if you can get some information right away but so we just decided, you know, we, we only know one thing here, and it's the Geneva Convention. It's the law of land warfare. We study it every year. It's a required mandatory topic. Let's just adhere to that. And it seemed to be common sense. Obviously, that was not shared uh, in all places uh, in the military. Uh, and then the CIA, and in, in, when I did my confirmation hearing, I noted that I have opposed enhanced interrogation techniques, and I oppose them for two reasons. One is I do believe they're wrong, that they are against, again, various conventions. The second is they actually don't work, I don't think. Again, nobody had more experience with detainees than I did, because when I was a commander in Iraq, we had 27,000 Iraqi detainees, and then we had several thousand uh, in Afghanistan. In each case, it was the surge, and therefore we had a surge of detainees as well. Um, and our experience, especially also with our special operations forces, which had separate uh, detention facilities until they eventually pushed them over to the bigger ones, uh, all of which, by the way, I invited the Red Cross into, in some cases over the objections of some of my subordinates. Um, but the experience was that you have to become, you develop a relationship with a detainee uh, and so forth. Now, to be fair to the agency, and I said this, I've said this publicly and during the confirmation hearing, the pressure on the agency after 9-11 was enormous. And the thought at the time, and I was in Bosnia already deployed. I spent a year there from 2001 to 2002, and I had two hats. This is all publicly known now. I was the Brigadier General, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Operations for the NATO Stabilization Force, but I was also the Deputy Commander of a U.S. clandestine joint task force doing the war criminal hunt with all kinds of special operators, the biggest special ops and intelligence deployment in the world at the time. And, uh, and then we also did the first counterterrorism operations after 9-11 with these same forces. So again, I, I was in the loop, if you will, for all of the intel, and it just, it, the intelligence exploded right after 9-11. Um, and the pressure was enormous. There was a sense that there was something else, that this was just the prelude, this was just the first of many. And in a situation like that, I can understand how individuals did what they did, but having said that, I have felt very strongly that we should learn from that 
Uh, and, and frankly, even if there was something gained from that, I think the penalty to us, if you will, in the eyes of the world far outweighed whatever uh, modest information we may have gotten from use of those techniques. So, so can you talk a bit about what you learn makes for an effective interrogation and also how sure. your s stewardship of the CIA during yep. the period when it was in being investigated for uh, inter the enhanced interrogation tactics in 2011, 2012, how, how your opposition to torture kind of complicated that or maybe didn't? Didn't complicate it at all. I supported Senator Feinstein's uh, review. One of the disappointments of many of leaving when I did and how I did was that I didn't sign the letter that I had to her already drafted, uh, which would have said that I thank you for this extraordinary review. This was um, not universally applauded in the building, uh, certainly, but I thought it was very, very valuable. She went in and, and uncovered a great deal of information. As you may recall, a lot of it was subsequently made public. Um, but, and, and then talking about how, sort of why it happened in my view, than what we had learned from it, what we were doing going forward, because of course we stopped even holding detainees years earlier uh, before I became the director of the CIA, uh, and how we would in the future require every deputy director for operations to read this and, and, and so forth and so on. Um, look, what it takes to be a good interrogator uh, and really to have a backup team is you have to really understand the detainee, the network in which it's typically a he uh, operated, and what you're trying to do is develop the picture of that network. You're trying to understand, again, where are the other individuals, and then obviously from a targeting perspective, and I'm talking about detaining now. By the way, you always really want to detain rather than uh, to capture rather than kill if you can. And it's only in cases where you just absolutely cannot do that uh, for some reason or other uh, that then there's a, where you use a strike. Um, but again, it's, then you have to have really good linguists. Ideally, the interrogator is a linguist. And again, the best interrogators have been doing nothing but focusing on this particular target set, as we say, say Sunni extremists or Shia uh, militia. Uh, again, because they're all very, very different, and of course, they're different groups around the world. Sadly, we have seen Islamist extremism um, now in virtually every part of the Muslim world. And I think one of the lessons we've learned of the past 19 years or so of war, or perhaps a bit longer, uh, is that ungoverned spaces in the Muslim world will be exploited by Islamist extremism. Uh, the second is that you have to do something about it. You can't study this problem until it goes away because Las Vegas rules don't apply in these places. What stays there, do what happens there doesn't stay there. It tends to spew violence, extremism, uh, and instability in a tsunami of refugees, not just into neighboring countries, but in the case, say, of Syria or some of North Africa, all the way into European countries, causing the biggest domestic populism since the end of the Cold War, number three. You generally have to have the U.S. lead it because we have such a pre predominance of the capabilities that are proven so useful now. The constellation of drones, the industrial strength ability to fuse intelligence, uh, precision strike assets and all the rest. But we do want a coalition, as I mentioned earlier, and that coalition should include Muslim countries, uh, which is why I wrote an article at one point in time now, it's probably four years ago, in the Washington Post that Muslim hate speech is counterproductive if you're fighting against Islamist extremists. And by the way, this is a fight within a civilization, within the Muslim world. It's an existential fight for them, much more than it is a clash of civilizations or between them, as Sam Huntington's book title uh, talked. Uh, the number four lesson is that you can't counter extremists with just counter uh, terrorist forces. So you, it's, you have to do more to terrorists than just drone strikes and Delta Force raids. You have to have a comprehensive civil military campaign with all the elements that we had in the uh, comprehensive campaign that Ambassador Crocker and I were privileged to oversee during the surge in Iraq. But ideally, without us doing all of the fighting, especially on the front lines, without us having to do the reconciliation, the restoration of basic services, reconstruction, all of which we had to do during the surge or that place was going up in flames. 
Um, so we want them to be doing this. And, and happily, we have been able to figure out how to do that far better because of the uh, additional capabilities that we can bring to bear now that just weren't around even during the days of the surge in Iraq or Afghanistan. The fifth lesson is a tough one, and that is you have to acknowledge that this is a generational struggle. It's not the fight of a decade, much less a few years, and there's no hill to take, plant the flag, and go home to a victory parade. Uh, we have to stay at this. So we need a, a sustained commitment, but you can only sustain a commitment in a democracy if it is sustainable, and the metrics for that typically are the expenditure of blood and treasure. Uh, we generally have been able to figure that out, and I think that is very, very important. Um, but again, to come back to Gina, Gina um, look, we evaluated that. There were anybody who was anybody at the time in the CIA was engaged in the counterterrorist effort right after 9-11. I mean, they, it was all hands on deck. Um, unless somebody was serving somewhere where they just couldn't be pulled out, they were thrown into this. Uh, again, not stuff for which we'd done a great deal of deep thinking. Enormous pressure uh, on the, the leaders and, and it was transmitted all the way. I felt it, as I said, even as a Brigadier General uh, in Bosnia. Uh, and, and that pressure led us to take actions that, I, that we look back on now and I think do conclude uh, were imprudent and wrong. Um, she shared that conclusion uh, and again, she was not alone. There were several others that I actually plucked out because they were so very, very good and very important uh, to that organization and put them in positions from which they could at least, again, compete for ultimately uh, one of the deputy director positions or the deputy director. So there, there are a ton of different directions that I am thinking about the ways that I could take that. But the, the immediate thing that comes to mind is the recent deliberations within the administration to pardon war criminals. And I wonder how you reacted to that news and, and what kind of damage you think that does to the perception of, of not only the perception of the military, but also <coughs> the morale. I would just okay. come back to what I said earlier, that uh, our conclusion as we were engaged in tough combat and against a very resilient, determined, sometimes barbaric uh, enemy uh, was that you should adhere to the law of land warfare, uh, which is again mirrored in our uniform code of military justice and so forth. And that when we have violated that, that we have generally paid a very heavy price for it. Again, the price far exceeds whatever advantage or whatever benefit you got out of carrying out some particular activity. Um, and so anything that sort of runs counter to that, uh, I think is, uh, calls that logic into question. And I think that is, that is decidedly unhelpful. And then the other question I had related to, you know, the fight against extremism is Jim Mattis. He resigned in December, mostly because the president decided to abruptly withdraw from um, Syria and potentially Afghanistan, but I, I, I'm wondering how you reacted to that resignation because it was so strong. It was the strongest resignation that we've seen in terms of you know the language that was used, the rationale that was given. Um, is that well? I reacted of, first of all by sending an email to Jim Mattis that said you know thanks for. Uh, all that you've done over the past two years, uh, in addition to the previous, whatever it was, 40 or so in uniform. Did it surprise uh, you? Well done, shipmate. No, I think you could feel some of this. I mean, I obviously know him well. I would see him in various places a couple of times uh, privately. And, and again, um, there always has to be sufficient alignment, I think, between uh, a cabinet official, a secretary, defense, whatever, and the, the president. And if that is not there, then I think, you know, it's understandable that you, uh, if the president is not taking your advice on issues over time that are significant, important to you and you think to the country, uh, then I think it makes sense to allow the president to get somebody whose advice he will take. Um, this, you know, I had considerations of this. It, 
once or twice in my life. I mean, this is not unique. Obviously, the action of actually resigning uh, is, is somewhat unique. But um, again, it was over issues, some of which we've discussed. Uh, alliances, the importance of those uh, was mentioned. Um, certainly, the uh, possibility of withdrawing from Syria, which thankfully we have not done. Uh, and in fact, I think what that did is it forced a very searching examination uh, and to come back to what should be the objectives in Syria and what generally are, I think. Um, and if you agree with those, because again, it's always good to start sort of strategically. Again, try to get the big ideas right. Try to agree on the objectives. Uh, and then the rest of it falls out. By the way, if you accepted my five lessons that we should have learned from the past 19 years of war or so, the policy falls out pretty quickly and you are a little, I mean, you can remain frustrated with the challenges in a place like Afghanistan uh, and that we haven't been able to withdraw our troops and all the rest of this. And by the way, nobody is ever more frustrated or nobody knows the sacrifices better than, frankly, than the individual actually commanded both Iraq and Afghanistan and also US Central Command at the very height of all those operations. But again, if you accept those lessons, you then accept that you need an enduring commitment, um, a sustained commitment, just have to make sure it's sustainable. When it comes to Syria, I think the objectives are pretty straightforward. Um, we should want to ensure the enduring defeat of the Islamic State, not just the defeat and then go home and then have to come back again. We have seen this movie before. Um, I'm not saying that if we'd left troops in Iraq, combat troops, that we absolutely could have presented, prevented Prime Minister Maliki from taking the very ruinous sectarian decisions that he did that undid all that we had done during the surge and the subsequent three and a half years to keep the fabric of, bring the fabric of society back together and then keep it together and, and convince people to support the new Iraq rather than to oppose it. And he un, undid all of that. But I think we certainly would have been in much better position to react to the, uh, offensive by the Islamic State into Iraq uh, had we had those footprint locations, if you will. So in Syria, you want to ensure the enduring defeat of Daesh, of the Islamic State. I, I don't see how you can pull out and ensure that. We want to ensure that the Iranians cannot uh, establish hegemony over the so-called Shia Crescent, uh, that they can't uh, connect a, a ground line of communication in particular that would run from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, and down into southern Lebanon, which would be very dangerous for our Israeli allies. Uh, and then we also need to ensure some kind of political resolution that takes care of the very uh, fighters who actually did defeat Daesh on the ground with our support uh, from the air and with a variety of other enablers, advice, support, and assistance. Um, and these are the Syrian Democratic Forces and predominantly Syrian Kurds, but also as you get further south, Syrian Sunni Arabs. So again, look at the objectives and then see how you achieve those. And again, I don't see how you could achieve. I happened to be with Senator Lindsey Graham that weekend. Uh, we were at the Munich Security Conference together uh, and both of us uh, were quite concerned about that. And I know that he was conveying back to the White House I think directly to the president, the concerns, and, and, thank, and others were talking or communicating with other folks. Uh, and thankfully, I think that that particular idea uh, was taken off the table. Uh, my hope in Afghanistan, again, if you could get an agreement with the Afghan Taliban uh, that is reasonable, okay, but I see no prospects whatsoever uh, to negotiate something that is acceptable when the Taliban won't even allow the popularly elected government of Afghanistan to have a representative at the table. Uh, as good as Ambassador Sal Khalilzad is, and he is very, very good, um, if we couldn't get a deal with the Taliban when we had 150,000 NATO troops, when I was privileged to be the commander, and we had the incomparable Richard Holbrook, the bulldozer as the ambassador for the AFPAC region and the negotiations, I don't know how you get it. And we were on the offensive and we had the momentum, as you will recall, we were rolling the Taliban back, making pretty steady progress. Um, I don't know how you do it at a time when I think the Taliban feel that they have a degree of momentum. Certainly the security situation is 
a good bit more fraught. So uh, again, always come back to what is it we're trying to achieve? Uh, what are the objectives? Um, how do we keep, again, Al-Qaeda from reestablishing a sanctuary in Afghanistan, uh, similar to the one that they enjoyed when the Taliban controlled the bulk of the country, and they did plan the 9-11 attacks in that sanctuary and did the initial training of the attackers. And they want to reestablish that. They are still there trying to do that, and we are preventing them from doing that. And of course, we also uh, have in Afghanistan a, a platform for the regional counterterrorism campaign, as it's termed, which is hugely important to us. It, by the way, also, you know, I have a lot of concern for the Afghans and especially those who have sacrificed a great deal uh, to certainly help their own country, but in many cases doing it together with us. So we only have about five minutes left, um, but I have to ask you about Iran sure. and the escalating tensions. Do you, do you see any parallels between the 2003 invasion of Iraq Not at all. and no. the escalating no, tensions No, and I've said here. this publicly on a number of different occasions. Um, there was a, an impetus toward war with Iraq that was palpable. And of course there was, however wrong it may have been, a true belief that there were weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq. Uh, and I absolutely subscribe to that now, not because I was party to the the various whatever raw intelligence showed that. But, you know, I'd been the executive officer for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs for two years as a full colonel. Uh, by the time of the invasion, I was a two-star and division commander. But it was an article of faith. And we'd actually done strikes uh, against Saddam Hussein's um, production means and delivery means for WMD. I mean, it was truly accepted that there were WMD. And it was a huge shock when it didn't turn out uh, that that was the case. But I don't see any uh, thought really at all of invading Iran, a country that is three times the population of Iraq when we invaded it, and probably four or more times uh, the landmass uh, of Iraq. So what do you think I'm the goal sure is? I'm sure they're dusting off. The, well, the goal, I think, is to bring Iran back to the table. I really do think that is the case, and to uh, probably address some of the issues uh, that have been um, identified as shortcomings to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the, the nuclear agreement. And I should note that um, there were very good features of this. All of the medium enriched uranium was, uh, was taken out, 99% of the low enriched uranium, the plutonium passed to a bomb was eliminated, cement poured into the reactor core, pretty intrusive inspections could be better. Um, and and the number of centrifuges spinning reduced fairly considerably, and the deeply buried site inside the mountain uh, is actually turned into a research facility to which we have access with inspectors. The problem is, of course, that it all ends at 10 or 12 or whatever years, different elements of it, and there's no provision for what follows. Uh, no confidence that they would actually follow the non-proliferation treaties uh, advance, uh, protocol. So that is a real concern. And then the other issue, of course, is that there did not follow in the wake of the nuclear agreement some kind of new era of good feeling between the US and Iran that led Iran to stop the ever more threatening missile testing that they were conducting, uh, and also the very, very damaging uh, actions, the so-called malign activities, where they're supporting uh, Shia militia in Iraq uh, various militia and others uh, in Syria uh, to prop up the murderous Bashar al-Assad's regime. Uh, of course, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Houthis in Yemen, and a variety of other uh, issues in the region that they are fomenting. Uh, and that is very, very serious. So these are legitimate concerns. Now, whether you pull out of a multilateral agreement that hasn't been violated, that can certainly be question, you still have grounds to put sanctions back on because of the missile and the malign activities. But you don't um, think the goal is regime change? No, I don't think that. No, I actually, the president has said it's not regime change. I don't, I don't know how you could bring about regime change uh, short of taking out the regime the way we took out the regime in Iraq. And I think people recognize that. Uh, it, it doesn't mean you don't hope for regime change because this is a pretty nefarious regime. By the way, keep in mind that in Iran, something we often overlook is that there are two states in Iran. There's the visible state. This is a popularly elected president, uh, 
a parliament, ministers, and Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, all that. You can see all of that, and we tend to focus on what the president is saying or his foreign minister, a very fluent English speaker. But then there's the deep state, and that generally is more in the background, although one of the individuals has been much more visible than he certainly ever dared to be when I was the commander in Iraq or the region, Qasem Soleimani, the commander of the Revolutionary Guards Corps Quds Force. Um, but this is the supreme, the supreme leader's at the top of all of it, but again, he's somewhat reclusive. But over the deep state, that's where you have the uh, Revolutionary Guards Corps, Army, Navy, Air Force, Quds Force, the sort of a cross between special ops and, uh, and CIA or what have you. Uh, and then the besieged militia, which could number as many as a couple of million, they're basically pipe swingers who will go out on the streets and ensure that there is never uh, any kind of uh, big protest that might actually threaten uh, regime stability. Um, and that is what is really running a lot of what it is that we're concerned about. By the way, I got a message from Qasem Soleimani in the middle of a fight in 2008, a very big battle, the Battle of, of Basra all the way in the south, uh, where we're supporting Iraqi forces that were fighting the militia that were supported uh, largely by Iran. Uh, and then it ended up in Sadr City and Baghdad and a bunch of other locations. And we de destroyed them in these battles. But it was a close run affair in the beginning because of the impulsive nature of the, the start of it. And during the middle of that, I got a message from Qasem Soleimani that said, General Petraeus, you should know that I, Qasem Soleimani, control the policy for Iran when it comes to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, and Afghanistan. In other words, you know, don't fool around with the foreign ministry or these ambassadors who aren't Quds Force ambassadors. Um, you deal with me. Um, now, I didn't exactly respond uh, politely to that. I basically told him to pound sand. But, you know, that's, think about what he said. That's who controls the policy for that country. So don't pay attention to the, the visible state. Pay attention to the deep state. I think we have to go to questions now. And students first. Only fitting that the, go ahead. Good evening, sir. My name is Nick Pereso. I'm a first year Master of Public Policy student, and I'm an active duty Naval officer. I'm curious what you think about retired military flag officers playing a role in politics and endorsing candidates. Uh, we had General John yep. Allen endorsing Clinton at the DNC. Yep. Conversely, you had General Mike Flynn leading chants of lock her up at the RNC. Yep. Are those kinds of things appropriate? And to what degree should retired flag officers be participating in politics? Obviously, each retired senior officer has to make his own decision on that. But my general thinking has been that it is not helpful to those who follow us. Uh, by the way, same as if you're a former director of the CIA. Again, I generally think that it, it tends to raise doubts in the minds of the president and perhaps other policymakers um, if those who were recently retired are very, very visible, very vocal, and very much being political rather than bipartisan or even, as I have tried to be, nonpartisan. I, you know, I actually stopped voting when I was promoted to two stars. I don't advocate this for others, but it was appropriate, I thought. Um, I served under, in, in Senate confirmed positions where you actually have a really serious confirmation hearing, i.e. they're all beating you up for uh, multiple positions for a Republican president and two major positions for uh, a Democratic president. Uh, and since retirement, I have generally, I have not endorsed candidates. I have given advice to candidates of either party. Um, I don't contribute. Uh, I have uh, candidly been a bit supportive of uh, Seth Moulton, when he ran for Congress, um, he's a Democrat, uh, but he came out of Harvard Business School at my request to come back to Iraq and come back on active duty, having already left active duty, uh, to serve yet another year. I had already extended him for a year in an earlier tour when I was a three-star. I didn't, again, endorse him or contribute or something, but again, there was a bit, of, uh, a bit more encouragement. And I also, frankly, conversely, uh, although I didn't sign the big letter of all the four stars for Senator McCain, I did write an op-ed at one point in the Arizona Daily that was titled Saluting a Hero. 
um, and it was about Senator John McCain without getting into supporting his bid at that time for uh, his final time he ran for the Senate. And I spoke at his, uh, his private service as well. But again, I just don't think it is helpful to those who follow us um, if we are highly partisan and if we are, uh, again, throwing our voice into this. By the way, I also think it's just a little bit not fair because, you know, we all still want to be called general um, and, and sort of get the reflected glory, if you will, of those who are still in uniform. Um, and yet here you are uh, being very, very highly partisan. So again, it, it has to be a decision that each has to make. Uh, but in my view, uh, I think the quietest tradition uh, in this particular respect is most warranted. Thank you. And thanks for what you're going to do in the future. Shipmate. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Colin Andrew. I'm studying uh, Latin American studies and a master's student. Uh, anyways, switching hemispheres, I was wondering, in your opinion, what the U.S. should do, if anything, uh, regarding the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela and the political crisis between uh, Juan Guaido and uh, Nicolas yeah. Maduro. Well, I think we've done a great deal already, of course. Um, we certainly not seem to be poised to send forces in to topple uh, the regime, but we have obviously picked sides. Uh, we are actively supporting Guaido. Uh, we've encouraged other countries to do that quite, quite strongly. Uh, we saw Secretary Pompeo when he was in Europe this past week as well, and he mentioned that this is some of what he is, is doing also with respect to the policy for Iran. We have provided a great deal of humanitarian assistance, although we, obviously a good bit of that was blocked from going into the country. Uh, we are poised, certainly, to enter with a great deal of assistance uh, should the regime topple. The problem that you have in Venezuela uh, in, is, is a significant one because you can't look at, say, Egypt as a case and compare that to Venezuela. And the reason is that in Egypt, um, when President Mubarak was under the enormous pressure and there are millions of people in Tahrir Square in Cairo, uh, the military did its calculations uh, and it said, you know what, he's going down. Um, we are a professional institution. Why don't we just tell the people we're not going to shoot at them, we stand back. Uh, who, when the dust settles and somebody replaces him, we will be still in our positions in the institution uh, and in a sense, life can go on. Um, that is not the case for many of the senior military leaders and other senior government leaders. This is a, this is a criminal entity uh, heavily involved in illegal narcotics activity. Many of them have uh, uh, various sanctions or indictments or what have you. Um, they're all worried about that. This is not a case where you can fly into Haiti and tell President Cedrus, you know, he'll, we'll give you a plane and fly you to, I forget, he went to Panama or somewhere. And if you don't, the 82nd Airborne, which is already in, in route, and it was, by the way, and they wanted to jump on Port-au-Prince. And it was the brigade I took command of, uh, actually after returning from Haiti myself. They were hugely disappointed not to get their combat jump. Um, but, it, of course, Cedrus said, okay, you know, I can have a nice exile. It's tougher in this case. What do you do with Maduro? Who really wants him? I mean, he could go to Cuba, but how is that working out right now? And of course, he's not providing the kind of oil exports to them that sustained them for so many years. They do certainly have a lot of intelligence officers and others on the ground stiffening the, his spine and the forces and so forth. Um, this is a very, very tough situation, I think, and I fear uh, that it's going to have to go a reasonable amount longer and that ultimately the country is going to have to literally completely run out of money uh, until there is such a collapse and such outrage by the population, uh, a population which is already experiencing blackouts during much of the day, the hospitals are, are chaotic, uh, no medicines, no basic foodstuffs, uh, diapers, formula, all of this is just completely lacking. So he's failing his country clearly, but I think sadly it's going to have to almost completely collapse. Uh, and then what do you do with all these individuals who are around him who have benefited from the extraordinary level of corruption uh, that has been so significant in the mismanagement of the economy, so significant that it has destroyed a country that has the largest proven oil reserves in the entire world? 
it should be an incredibly prosperous place as it was prior to uh, Chavez taking over and, and beginning the process that has now driven it into the ground. Thank you. Hi, General. Just wanted to thank you for being here. My name is Xander. I'm a first year at the college. Um, I just you mentioned earlier in the in the event in the in the conversation that you thought we were entering a renewed era of like security competition with other great powers. Um, so I wanted to get your opinion on your thoughts on like working with those great powers and addressing issues in the Middle East going forward. Well, when I'm talking about the uh, competition among great powers, I'm really talking about the resurgence of Russia. Uh, with Vladimir Putin, um, and certainly it's not a resurgence across the board. I, I forget who it was that said that Russia is now a gas station with guns or a gas station with nukes or something like that. I, but don't get me wrong, this is a gas station that really matters. Um, and of course, until uh, our energy revolution propelled us to be number one in crude oil production, oil liquids production, and natural gas production, uh, Russia was rising, riding uh, very, very high, um, but still has ex such extraordinary resources and, and, uh, and still a lot of other uh, attributes that allow it to play a very big role on the stage, especially with Putin, who's, who loves to, to walk the global stage and loves in particular to poke the U.S. in the eye, and now is actually uh, doing agreements with China which I think has a very transactional view of the relationship, doesn't see Russia in remotely the same league as China, uh, nor should it, but still a, a convenient relationship to have. And then the other big relationship, obviously, is, is the competition is the one that I talked about earlier, uh, which is one which, again, paradoxically, when we were faced off with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact during the Cold War, we didn't do much trading at all. We occasionally sold some excess wheat or some other uh, goods to Russia, but very, very little in the way of trade. Again, with China, uh, one of our top three trading partners. Certainly China more dependent on that by several orders of magnitude than we are, uh, but still uh, a very, very important relationship in that regard. That's the the competition and also the relationship, again, that matters most in, in Africa. Uh, in the Gulf, in other places, uh, certainly throughout Southeast and Southern Asia and all the way through Eurasia, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is being pursued by China under President Xi, um, has a lot of economic uh, consequences and implications. Um, there have been, I think, legitimate concerns raised about some of the financing uh, terms, if you will, uh, that some have characterized as a bit more neo-colonialism than development aid the way that, say, Japan or the U.S. or the EU uh, or European countries would provide it. But again, there is a certain degree of competition that is represented by that. And in fact, the U.S. is starting to get back into that in a way. We've doubled the size of our uh, in, in this separate development bank. Uh, and we are partnering with Japan and other major donors uh, to uh, provide alternatives, if you will, uh, to what China could offer. And with different terms, uh, I might add as well, though even China, by the way, has actually changed, making changes uh, as a result of some of the experiences. But that's a serious competition. Uh, and again, it is playing out. I, one hopes it doesn't become a true Cold War the way we experienced for so many decades uh, after the end of World War II, uh, and that this can be a beneficial relationship to both sides. But again, you see signs already, as I said, of a degree of tech fracture, of tech Cold War, that I think already has ramifications uh, that you're starting to see when it comes to supply chain uh, concerns uh, and that kind of development. So does that answer what you were after, or? I just want to know specifically like how we could leverage um, our relationship with Russia and China to, like, to coordinate and address issues in the Middle East, um, just given your vast experience in the region. Well, Russia has not been a particularly helpful partner, candidly, in the Middle East. Um, you look at what they've done to prop up Bashar al-Assad, uh, they feel deeply uh, gr huge grievance about the fact that a UN Security Council resolution was passed for a humanitarian action in Libya that turned into toppling Gaddafi. 
Um, you know, Russia sees there are conspiracy theories here everywhere that, you know, the Ukrainian in the Maidan, the big upheaval there was actually U.S. instigated to take the bloom off uh, Russia in the wake of the Sochi Olympics, that great triumph, all of this kind of stuff. So again, I don't think you're going to see, it's not to say there aren't some common interests. It's not to say that in uh, Syria that you don't have a common interest uh, against Islamist extremists or in, in Afghanistan for that. I actually wanted, I was supposed to go to Moscow at one point when I think I was Central Command Commander and I was going to lay out the three big common interests that we had. Again, against Islamist extremism, uh, against the illegal narcotics trade that was coming out of Afghanistan in particular, uh, and uh, also for the economic development of the Central Asian states. Um, didn't get to do that, but again, you can always, and, and certainly you should have strategic dialogue uh, with your competitors. I think one of the great developments, you know, the abilities of Henry Kissinger, um, to talk with Russia, talk with China, to talk with others, to establish true strategic dialogue was very, very helpful uh, in subsequent developments and got arms control in the mid midst of uh, the Cold War. Please. Hi, my name is Annalise. I'm a first year master's in public policy student at the Harris School. Um, so last week, the NATO Secretary General said that NATO is beginning to operationalize its cyber capabilities. Yep. So from the perspective of someone who has commanded NATO forces, do you believe that NATO is adapting quickly enough to these kinds of changing technologies like cyber? And do you think that there will be serious interoperability concerns if the different allies are advancing their technologies at different rates? Well, in fact, one of the functions of the NATO cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, I think I've gotten that right, in Tallinn, Estonia, on whose board I sit, uh, in which runs the an annual cyber conference every year, which I usually attend, is to indeed try to improve interoperability uh, and to improve the level of uh, education, training, and so forth on, on cyber. Um, what the Secretary General, I think, was really trying to emphasize is that there is a something that we in the United States and other countries have also sought to recognize, and that is that there is a whole new domain of warfare, uh, that you no longer have just land and sea and air and arguably space, maybe even subsea. You now have cyberspace, and that's actually, there's battles ongoing in cyberspace on a daily basis. Uh, there are attacks every day, uh, just you know, in, innumerable attacks. Uh, that we are defending. Now, they don't always cross the threshold where we feel that we have to do something, either economically with sanctions, legally with uh, some kind of uh, indictments or what have you, uh, but those are ongoing. And what he's really uh, articulating is just an awareness that any future fights are going to be fought in cyberspace as well as, again, land, sea, and air. Um, at the end of the day, there are several countries in NATO that have very considerable capabilities. Uh, the two that come most to mind are the US and the UK. The UK has GCHQ, that is their version of NSA. It is exceedingly capable. Germany has just formed a cyber command. It already has thousands of soldiers uh, in it, and all of them are developing capabilities. But certainly, again, the country that spends more than twice as much as all 28 of the rest together is always going to have uh, vastly more capability and therefore is generally going to have to be the core of our any kind of operations that we envision. I mean, there was a reason that you had a US, US four star as the commander of the, the NATO, International Security Assistance Force, um, and it's because you then also bring, you have actually U.S. only capabilities that you can bring to bear in addition to the coalition abilities. And you're always dual hatted. So I was both the U.S. Forces Afghanistan commander and the NATO ISAF commander. Um, and again, I think we will lead the way, uh, but certainly there are other countries with very capable uh, cyber uh, abilities. China is very significant in that regard. And one of the concerns, of course, that has led to some of the 
trade differences, the, the tariffs, uh, in addition to the trade imbalance, which the president is focused on, but actually the trade representative is focused on a number of other uh, concerns. But among these also is the uh, very substantial theft of intellectual property uh, through cyberspace. Uh, and then Russia has great capability. We saw them try to uh, disrupt our elections, to undermine our faith in democracy, and to put the scales on the finger on the scales of our last presidential election. We've seen them try to do that elsewhere as well. North Korea, which has used it to try to intimidate Sony Pictures when the, the movie was coming out that they didn't like about Chairman Kim. Uh, they also raise hard currency with a variety of criminal activity. And then Iran, which destroyed 35,000 uh, uh, laptops and computers uh, in Saudi's uh, state-owned oil company. So again, there's a lot of capabilities out there. Uh, this warfare has already gone on. It's publicly known that one of the ways that we defeated the Islamic State was in cyberspace going after their <coughs> cyber capability, which was pumping hate and extremist uh, content and recruiting and exhortation uh, through social media, internet, and so forth to, to bring others on board. And, that, and ultimately, that media center in Raqqa was destroyed along with many of the key leaders of that center. So this is very much uh, a new battlefield, a new domain of warfare. And that's really, I think, what he was getting at. Please. We have time for one more question, okay. sadly. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Alejandro Alvarez. I'm research staff in, uh, at the university. My question is about Afghanistan. So I've been studying the situation there, and it seems like since the moment of the invasion, the goals have changed a lot, and it went to, into mission creep. So at the beginning, it was going after Al-Qaeda and destroying all the operational bases. Then it was going after uh, the Taliban. Then it was after na nation building. And it's keep changing the situation over and over again. Uh, so my question is, how, who, is the, who is the people or who, who are the person making the decisions into changing the goals? Because, of course, that's going to make the decision sure. uh, and the process yep. more difficult on, yep. for your side. Uh, yeah. So what's no, going I mean, on? The commander-in-chief makes these kind of decisions. The United States commander-in-chief, and then when it was made a NATO command, uh, also obviously the NATO North Atlantic Council, um, which is articulated typically through the Secretary General and then the Supreme Allied Commander makes its way down to the commander in Afghanistan. Um, look, I, I had uh, a great slide that I used when I was the commander in Afghanistan. And this was in, uh, I took command in, I think, 4th of July 2010 uh, and held it for a bit over a year. And the slide was titled, Getting the Inputs Right. And we didn't even get the inputs right in Afghanistan. I'm talking the right big ideas, because again, strategic leader have to get the big ideas right, communicate them, oversee them, and then determine how to refine them and do it again and again and again. We didn't have the big ideas right. We went in thinking we could just get rid of, just defeat Al Qaeda, destroy Al Qaeda, hand off to some Afghan, and then we would leave. Well, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and so therefore we realize, oh gosh, we got to do some more. Maybe we have to train their security forces. Maybe we have to help them reestablish a government. Uh, well, that wasn't enough. Well, maybe we have to help with, again, a whole variety of what became tasks uh, associated with nation building. Um, and you know, whether you like it or not, someone did have to perform those tasks. Uh, in, in many cases, it ended up being performed by coalition forces, US in particular. Um, and also by coalition civilians. Um, and then the Taliban came back, and then Al-Qaeda came back, and, and again, but we, you know, you can blame some of it on me for asking for everything we could get for the surge in Iraq, um, but at the end of the day, we didn't have the right big ideas until I would contend somewhere, that was a little bit before I took command, I'd give General McChrystal a lot of credit for that, we didn't have remotely the number of forces we needed. We never really truly got everything, but we got close. But you know, we had it for about six months, and we started a drawdown. And we'd already told the enemy when we were going to draw down, which does not you know, help to show the level of commitment in a, in a test of wills uh, that you want the enemy to think. I refused in Iraq to even admit to Congress that we were going to draw down um, until, you know, say, a month or so before I would pull each brigade out from the surge force, even though I knew we had to. And we'd already extended our troops from 12 to 15 months 
in the Army. It's a very, very long tour uh, for those who, most of whom had already done one or even two tours, a year-long tour before. Um, and then a whole variety of other. We didn't have the right organizational architecture. We didn't have the right structures. We didn't have uh, the right partners. We didn't have the right people. Uh, all of this was lacking, and we had it for a period of time, uh, again, starting in late 2010 when the final surge forces arrived in Afghanistan, and of course, uh, the drawdown of those in a modest way began the, the following summer. All the surge forces were out within another 18, 15 months of that, and then we, we began the drawdown. Now, that is what took place there, and certainly there have been some very, very hard lessons learned from that, as there were uh, from Iraq, where, you know, lesson number one, I always said, because I was part of the invasion force as a division commander of the great 101st Airborne Division, um, the very first lesson was that you should really understand a country with enormous detail and rigor and uh, nuance before you invade it. Uh, and we did not have that level of understanding uh, of that country. You'll remember, you know, I, well, I also learned that when you have a journalist riding in the backseat of your Humvee or helicopter, everything you say is on the record. And I happen to have three-time Pulitzer Prize winner Rick Atkinson, who kept writing down every time, as I said, Rick, tell me how this ends. Uh, because it was very clear to me very early on that all the hopeful assumptions and optimistic uh, outcomes that had been pitched in Kuwait just were not uh, realistic. So, you know, we should learn everything we can from all of these. Uh, and, you know, for the students who are here, there's a lot of material there. I actually want to end, if I could, just with something for the students, in addition to my thanks to everyone for being here so late into the evening at the end of the, an academic year. And that is, for the students, when I'm asked, what is it that you think is the most important uh, uh, element in success. Uh, and, you know, there's all the usual ones about working hard and, you know, don't do drugs and don't post stupid stuff <laughs> on social media that will haunt you when you try to go to the CIA. I mean, all these kind of, but you all know that. Uh, but one that is not quite, I don't think, is just sort of universally uh, recognized is the value of seeking, actually performing out of your intellectual comfort zone experiences. Um, and I mean, this is why I went to graduate school instead of, say, to a, an infantry unit again. And I was told I was committing professional suicide at the time. It didn't quite work out that way. Uh, and that turned out to be an incredible experience. Instead of doing the war college, I did a fellowship at Georgetown. And then instead of completing the fellowship, I went to Haiti with the UN. I mean, these were unbelievable uh, in terms of development. Um, and again, get out of your intellectual comfort zone. Experience people whose views are different. Um, talk to actual Chinese uh, students uh, and, and visit that country. Um, these are the kinds of experiences that I think stand you in very good stead when years later you're thrust into something that is completely unexpected, like being the commander of all of northern Iraq um, when nobody was giving us any guidance and when happily, because of some of these experiences and study and dissertation and a variety of other activities, um, we sort of didn't lack for guidance. We, did, we didn't need some guidance, frankly, and that was okay with us and generally did what made reasonable sense, uh, produced decent outcomes, and later became the core of what we ultimately did during the surge, which drove violence down by 85% and gave Iraq a whole new opportunity for life. So that would be my one bit of advice uh, for the students who are here, uh, along with, again, my thanks to all of you for being here and for staying with us throughout a very stimulating endeavor. And thanks for being my interrogator, Thank not you. the topic. <laughs>